и земля, люди боги и мы, распятые на кресте толкования. Thank you to everyone for being here for this truly momentous event. Uh, and I now give the floor back to Professor Dugan. So, uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to, to invite, uh, as Jay has already explained, uh, we are now uh, many people living in many places in the world. So there is the difference of time. And in some countries, uh, there is too late in other um, the day. Uh, so uh, we, we start by these geographical principles in order to not uh, uh, make too much burden on our Asian, uh, Asian friends who are living in the, in the parts of the earth where there is the deep night. So uh, we are starting with Thailand, Thailand. Uh, and with uh, our friend, great uh, political thinker, Pepe Escobar. Please, Pepe, take, take uh, a place. Thank you, Alexander. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm essentially here to listen to all of you. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a matter of time in Asia because I, I start working deep into the night. I, sp I spent my nights awake here, in fact, so that's not a problem. Um, the thing is, I, I, Alexander, I sent you, uh, in fact, a very short a question, in fact, uh, that I would like to put to you and to the table, the 121 of us at the moment, right? Um, conceptually, the force political theory is absolutely unique. There's no question about that. The way you formulate it better than anybody else. We can learn a lot, for instance, if we were, if we were Westerners, for instance, from the pre-Socratics, which have been totally uh, sidelines, not only after Plato and Aristotle, which is now being canceled, by the way, by, by the woke generation, but uh, in, the, in the history of philosophy in the West as well. It's only, only people who study deep philosophy in the West are familiar with the pre-Socratics you know, in depth. Uh, we can learn a lot about uh, how in China, for instance, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism uh, intermingle. And uh, across Chinese history, it was fantastic how they were absorbing each other. And nowadays, what you see essentially is a mix of all three. Yeah? We can learn a lot, for instance, uh, by uh, uh, how, how cross-cultural procedures work in Balinese culture, which is an extremely sophisticated form of Hinduism and shamanism, in fact, where you have essentially the visible world, uh, Sekala, and what really matters, the invisible world, Niskala. So we, we have, a, a, a, a, as you said, Alexander, a palette of uh, uh, philosophical currents, ways of thought, uh, cosmologies, like the Hopi cosmology in Northeast Arizona, the United States, is one of the most sophisticated cosmologies in the history completely sidelined. Even in the US, nobody knows about it. You know. So in, in terms of uh, how we're going to uh, start to organize this uh, uh, cross-cultural dialogue, I think we all agree on that. But then, when uh, I, I am sorry to bring this back to Earth in a real politic sense. So what do we have? I'm not, I'm not going to get into geopolitics, but essentially what do we have nowadays is the 0.001% against the rest. There's no more left. There's no more right. There's no more uh, fixed ideological position. This is completely dissolved. In fact, this is the end of postmodernism, which was to dissolve everything. 
Uh, I, I remember during the 80s, I, I was deep into postmodernism. Uh, I was deep into Deleuze Guattari, but also I was deep into Baudrillard. And Baudrillard in the 80s was, was already talking about, uh, like, you know, he was anticipating that we, soon we would be living in a room full of mirrors of simulacra. And that's, and that's what we are today. We are, we are in like a, you know, remember that uh, shootout uh, in The Lady from Shanghai by Orson Welles, that fantastic shootout in a room full of mirrors. This is where we are nowadays. And we cannot identify any, anything, a real image, uh, uh, the, the real human being, or the mirror, or all of them melded in something, in, into something else. So that's the problem. Uh, uh, we, we can, as good as we can be in terms of formalizing uh, a new, uh, a, a, a real, there is an alternative. You know, in, fact, in fact, the real Tina, this is what we're, we're talking about here. Uh, what, what's, what's happening already with COVID-19 is that this 0.001%, they are already operating their reset and the reboot of the system for their own purposes. In terms of, uh, I described it with, with a few uh, uh, concepts like uh, uh, uh, digital neo-fascism, which is what we are getting basically from, uh, from big data and a Silicon Valley, and a hybrid form of neo-fascism including restored neoliberalism or a neoliberalism 3.0 or 4.0, which they want to impose on the rest of the world with even more austerity, concentration of wealth and concentration for their own purposes. So my question, uh, okay, under three minutes, hopefully, for you, Alexander, and for all of you, how can we organize politically a response that make these people start being extremely scared of a real alternative emerging. And this means we're gonna to have to engage into an economic criticism of ultra neoliberalism or neoliberalism 3.0. So the question is there everybody and uh, let's start working on it. Thank you very much. For concrete, um, position. I think, interesting, so the power of this absolute minority to re, uh, reinstall and still uh, continue their rule resides in the idea, not in the money, not in the technology, but that is the thought. In our orthodox um, Christian tradition, for us, the devil, the diamond devil, is the thought, the wrong evil thought. So the evil thought is the power. And we cannot, uh, we cannot win evil thought with the sword, with the economy, with political uh, body. The thought can be won with the thought. So I, my short answer, we should start with the rethinking, revising uh, modern way of thought. So political modernity, we need to deconstruct the uh, intellectual history, the history of ideas. We need to find the moment when something went wrong. And I, for, for myself, that is the beginning of the modernity, of the Western modernity. And we need to restore the just proportions between the ideas, bodies, politics, economics. So we need to start with the paradigm, my, my answer. We could not be organized politically, economically, on, on the level of organization or structurally without the thought. And that we lack. The Putin lack idea, idea. Modern China somehow somehow lack idea. Modi lack idea. Trump lack idea. Lack, lack idea. Orban lack idea. All uh, Erdogan lack uh, lack idea. So we are badly in need of idea, and we will re when we resist to the globalization only 
only by the um, uh, uh, brutal power, we will be crushed. And we will lose in front of this small minority because this is minority that is riding over idea. So they are mastering their wrong idea. So that is in our orthodox things that is kind of antichrist. But antichrist as well is idea. So uh, I think that we should start to rethink many things, re revise and deconstruct Western political modernity and decolonize our minds, first of all. Decolonize. Not only Africa, Asia, Russia, or Latin America needs uh, decolonization. West, West needs decolonization from modernity because the modern West is colonized of, uh, by the modernity. So we need to, to liberate from this epistemological prison uh, wh uh, where, we are, uh, where we are. So that is my, my short answer. So uh, thank you very much for so starting. I think that somehow all our uh, speakers will, uh, will uh, take that in consideration because we are invited to, to answer this purpose question, all of you, because that is that is the question. That is the question with capital. We are starting from the from the east. Okay, so we we come in directly to Saurabh Shukla from India, uh, with uh, his version force political theory for India. Yeah. Hello to all of you. I will not be able to uh, open my video because of this uh, twelve at night. So sorry for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Dugin, for inviting me. As uh, I registered as a listener, but um, you gave me a privilege to speak regarding the poor political theory for India. Thank you so much for that. Uh, it's my voice coming to all of you. Uh, so, so uh, like a uh, professor has uh, said in earlier that uh, India uh, is a country and a civilization that hasn't left its pre-modern roots till yet. As uh, uh, we see uh, the vast villages, the tribals, and many peoples in uh, India. There are many cultural identities from uh, the Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from the west of India to the east of India. Uh, there are metropolitan cities and that are influenced by the west modern culture, but there are many things uh, that the Indian people hasn't left yet. That is their culture and civilization. And uh, that is there from the family values to their gods, uh, to the culture that belongs to their temples, uh, and basically to their uh, uh, the theory of Vedant and Veda, uh, to the worshipping of everything that is uh, till enshrined in um, the, the culture and the life of the Indian people. Uh, be, uh, so, uh, like uh, Professor Dugin in his Numakya project has also said, uh, that uh, India is an absolute civilization. Uh, he has said that uh, India uh, doesn't need anything from the West. In its, itself, uh, uh, India uh, is absolute in its own nature, in its own, uh, the people are complete and inherited. Uh, uh, so, uh, my co uh, I would also have a question that I would like to raise. Uh, key, uh, like that what, uh, uh, uh, integrity that the people uh, uh, in uh, India have uh, regarding their own culture, civilization, and norms, and like the uh, the pre-modern values they have. So, uh, what it can teach to the other multipolar civilizations, and it can teach a lot. So, I would like. Uh, uh, to ask a question from Mr. Dugin, as he has not just read and uh, is not just well a pundit of uh, in uh, Russian, but all the multipolar civilizations. So I would like to ask him, like, uh, what India can uh, uh, teach? The Indian civilization can teach to be on grounds to all the civilizations that are fighting for their own existence and multipolarity. So, so thank you, thank you, Mr. Shukla. So uh, I, I, I could my answer about India uh, is short. India can teach us all, absolutely all, because the greatest richness of the Indian civilization, Vedas, uh, Upanishads, that was regarded by Rene Guénon as the primordial tradition itself, very close to first primordial tradition. So. 
uh, we are all indebted to uh, to India, and I think that that is one of the most loyal to the Indo-European roots form of civilization. So uh, India for us, it is all, everything. So uh, it is uh, the real civilization of absolute, that is the name of my book dedicated to India culture, and I uh, strongly believe in that. And uh, now, thank you for your participation. Now uh, I would like to, to, to give the word to Akram Ejaz, very influential Pakistani um uh, thinker and um writer uh, i have met him in uh beijing uh, in in the course of very important conference and uh, after speaking with him with uh, mr ajama kras uh, uh 10 minutes in the bus, we have arrived to the, the complete coincidence, coincidence of our, our views. It's very rare. It's a kind of miracle. Uh, so I have seen him for the first time and we coincided in everything, in every details. So please, Mr. Ajaz Sakran. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dugan. It is good to see you. Um, yes, indeed, it was uh, such, uh, such a lovely morning when we bumped into each other in Beijing. And, uh, and I've told that story, I have shared that with some people. But due to paucity of time, <clears throat> I should uh, jump right into the ideas that we have at hand. Um, first of all, uh, the crisis of uh, liberalism itself, uh, the internal crisis of liberalism is very dangerous for the whole world. And your response to uh, uh, our friend uh, Pepe Escobar um, on the question on what should be done is that it all begins with thought. I could not agree any more with that. And I think you're absolutely right that it does begin with thought. Um, the liberals had several centuries since the subversion of the traditional thought, a process that begins perhaps with Renaissance and gradually uh, over the several centuries unfolds uh, into you know Scottish Enlightenment and Enlightenment then we have the Industrial Revolution and then you know pre-modernity, -moder high modernity and so forth, the periods that you're familiar with. That was a few centuries, four or five hundred years. Uh, my own anticipation is and on the intuitional level and one can easily prove it wrong is that perhaps not much time of that type is left. So also I keep in mind that Lao Tzu said, those who try to shape the world according to their own will will never succeed. The Prophet said, the Prophet of Islam said, al fi mu'akia, the best is in what has happened. But this does not mean that we should sit together, sit, sit back and, and, and resign, or the opposite. Uh, from a Muslim point of view, this is, it has become uh, mandatory upon me to embark upon an uh, intellectual jihad, which is a striving of personal efforts to resuscitate what needs to be resuscitated in anticipation uh, before the, it's a millenarian feeling before the type of uh, days we are living through, we all, all, many of us often feel uh, that end may be near. So now, uh, with a certainty, like uh, the Book of Certainty by, by uh, um, Martin Lings, uh, one can, who often invokes René Guinot, uh, we proceed with uh, the view that there's few things that will happen. Um, the appearance of the Antichrist or the Jal in Islam as a phenomenon, um, and first appears as a thought, then appears as a phenomenon. These phenomena take roots in norms and uh, rules in, in world institutions, then that certainly govern the, the command, the armies of the nation state and turn brothers against brothers. So the way out of that would be to um, do something which is, uh, it may establish some kind of universality Although I completely agree with you also that what the West had presented us as universality for so long was a fake 
universality. It was actually a very particular little thing from a corner of the world and it was cast on to the rest of the world. And we were fooled into thinking that this is universal, where it was not. Whereas real universality was there prior to the rise of the West uh, that most of the traditional civilizations believed in the following three things. One, that above this order of nature, there is another order of nature that is more superior to this order of nature and controls and wields final control over this order of nature. All of the civilization spiritual ideas would believe in that, I think. Second, the temporal and this relationship between the temporal and the spiritual, all of the civilizations of the world actually believed in the primacy of spiritual over temporal. And finally, third, rejection of liberalism or those strands of enlightenment that got us here today are to be rejected. So these three postulates can actually establish an ontology which will, which will give us um, a ground that we no longer need to borrow from uh, the West's special epistemology by, by resuscitating the older ontologies. So if we have these three things, and if all of the challengers of the West, the rest believe in these, for example, in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, uh, Islam, Christianity, Taoism, Confucianism, if I read all of them, they would say yes to all of these three. And if we have a shared premise of these, then we can say that by rejecting the fake universality of the West, we are actually hereby instituting uh, an authentic universality that existed before the rise of modernism. Um, now that and the last comment, of course, is to, uh, you know, how all this will happen, uh, which means who will bell the cat. I think that the idea, as you quite rightly said, is, is the root of everything, is the seed of everything. But then very quickly, this idea has to precipitate into information, which has to uh, first of all, grip the consciousness of the scholars and the uh, strong men of society, the people, uh, men and women who are affluent in society in, in their thinking, uh, who are the cognitive elite. And then that this elite then seizes control of the academia and media to gain a grip on the mass consciousness. And then we have the development of the new institution whose norms and regulations and beliefs and values are premised upon an alternative view of thinking, which is not actually alternative. It used to be mainstream until the Western fake alternative seized our souls. So uh, I think my time is up. Uh, I have a lot of other things as well, but uh, I'd be happy to engage with you after your remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Mr. Uh, Ajaz um, Akram. Among us uh, today, there are some uh, representative, uh, very important representative of uh, uh, traditionalism of Sophia Perenis, as uh, Princess Victoria, as Mark Sedgwick, famous, uh, and you, and many others. So I'm glad that we, we have the people like Pepe Escobar, who is rather anti liberal from the left uh, and the other people. So that, that is important to speak about the alternative universal, alternative universality that is based on the positive recognition of diversity, positive recognition of religious, different, all kinds of diversity. And that is the real universality. What we, we, we deal with, it is not universality, it is colonization. That is the dictatorship of the same this dictatorship of some uh, senseless um, imposition of the pseudo values uh, that destroys uh, real identity. And so that is, uh, that is uh, universality um, that um, is based on nihilism, nihilistic, and we uh, should fight for the real universality based on the positive understanding of the depth of our uh, tradition, religions, and culture. So, uh, Mark Sedgwick, who is uh, today with us, has suggested in his uh, excellent book, Against Modern World, that Genon and Evola 
have inspired much more uh, the modernity, preparing alternative. They have made the path, they've created the, the, the way, the path for us. In that sense, we need to put into practice and, and continue their great, uh, great uh, mission. So that is our task, our goal. Uh, I would, uh, now I would uh, come to Iran. And uh, it is a, a sad news that our good friend, Nader Talibzadeh, very famous, very famous uh, uh, director, film director, uh, I think more famous in Iran, uh, he uh, is uh, sick with uh, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, uh, but uh, that is bad uh, news, but... Um, um, there is as, as well as well uh, a good news that he is recovering, and uh, uh, uh, he uh, wants it very much to participate. Uh, but uh, he uh, just uh, sent us his um, his video. Please uh, be indulgent because he has the problem with cough uh, with with uh, with his disease. But he's fighting as real uh, Shia Iranian warrior of light to overcome this mortal disease and to be with all of us. This uh, we hope to overcome uh, in the next elections. Uh, less than a year from now in which uh, people have seen those who voted for these liberals which is uh, pro-western and have seen the havoc uh, we'll see a different situation god willing and going back to my own country iran we're experiencing some very difficult times the government that is running iran today is pseudo-liberal it has deviated uh, already many times from the line <coughs> of the revolution or the Velayt of Fari uh, and uh, the attractiveness of the, the pseudo-liberalism has created a lot of trouble. We have lost the value of our money in the past 10-11 months by one, one fourth our, our, our real has devaluated extremely due to these uh, pseudo-liberal policies. We look forward to the end of this government. This is the reality I'm, I'm telling you and the, and the dear audience. Those who adhere to the line of the revolution, those who adhere, adhere to a close relationship <coughs> with China, with Russia, <laughs> they um, have already taken over the parliament. And one more important thing that we have to mention is the coming elections in the U.S. The U.S. <clears throat> is on, on the verge of a sort of collapse. Uh, we used to theorize this and look at the books and talk about it, but today it's a reality. What we see today in Portland, in Seattle, is a reality. The mismanagement of the corona pandemic is uh, it's also another heavy testimony. So in three months, there's going to be from inside of America, we have we we probably will be witnessing something. No one can tell exactly what, but countries like our countries have, <coughs> are watching very carefully. What is going on? Uh, I'm sorry that I can't talk very long because I have uh, sort of a, a infection with the COVID-19, and I cough too many times as I'm trying to speak, but. Uh, these few words, I just wanted to give you my uh, views uh, and uh, I look forward to the effects that this conference will definitely have. I've also in the past tried very hard to always promote this line of the por fourth political f theory. I think it's a very important line and it has, um, it has certain adherents and followers also in, among the intellectuals in Iran. Um, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Uh, it's an honor for me to be able to speak in your Zoom conference. I just uh, want to remind uh, the those present about the last time that we convened and we had Professor Dugan and Professor Savin in our gathering was in Beirut. And in that 
conference, the New Horizon Conference in Beirut, it was a very important presence of Dr. Dugan <laughs> to discuss the fourth political theory. It was very well reflected in the Lebanese media and in the Arab world media. Uh, it was it proliferated everywhere. That's the reason why we have to be aware to do these conferences outside my country or your country in international atmospheres so these people can be seen. Uh, the enemy wants to hide personages, personages as, as Professor Dugan. <coughs> they try to create fear. Therefore, um, I'm very glad that we had that experience. It was a very good uh, beginning. I appreciate the the heroism of uh, of, of our friend Nader Talibzadeh, who um, is with us. Uh, among Iranians, we have uh, as well um, the uh, other speaker, Taras Chernenka, uh, the Russian. Uh, a young man who has converted in the, into Shiism and he's living in Tehran. I have met him there. Uh, he's very in, uh, interesting uh, young intellectual and uh, I would like to give uh, words, uh, speech, the possibility to speak to him. Please. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings. Uh, God be upon you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the conference and I would like also to thank the previous speakers especially Mr. Escobar for emphasizing uh, this uh, uh, the moment of uh, concentration of tremendous wells in a single hand uh, which is uh, economy based on the usury Principle. Talking about the postmodern world, uh, we cannot neglect, to my mind, the economic aspect, which is of a crucial importance. Uh, all the world religions, when I'm uh, speaking about the ethical finances and uh, ethical economy, I usually bring the name of Islamic economy, but some people feel uh, concerned, very much concerned with that. Uh, then uh, I have to say, if you are concerned with Islamic economy, put the word Islamic aside, because in many traditions, uh, in many heavenly traditions, as we call them, traditions of revelation, there are similar points indicating the basic principle uh, of ethical finance, according to which um, money could be exchanged only with uh, real tangible assets, such as uh, real labor and real products. You can never exchange money with money, uh, and the pure usury used uh, in a traditional uh, global financial system, which we are witnesses, uh, witnessing now worldwide. Unfortunately, it has deeply infected the Muslim world as well. Uh, it uses exchanging money for um, extra money without any efforts, without any products, and therefore the so-called interest rate does not concern about production level, about the morals in uh, relationships between credit institutions and clients and so on. Instead of moral finances, instead of uh, ethical finances which uh, could be able to support the national economy, the national product, uh, which could serve both uh, national identity, independence, and at the same time cooperation between different nations and countries. Instead of that, what do we witness is a pure uh, pragmatism, pure pragmatism which is transformed gradually into the uh, modern world contemporary enslavement. Enslavement by the powerful classes, enslavement of the weaker classes by the powerful ones, enslavement of the weaker nations by the more powerful ones, and uh, so on, which eventually uh, leads to a concentration of both finances and power in uh, the hands of few, few organizations, of few people, 
and uh, uh, therefore uh, it creates a new contemporary form of uh, totalitarianism or uh, dictatorship under the mask of uh, libertarianism, under the mask and under the pretext of uh, any kind of respect to human liberties and human rights. The only mean to oppose it is a transformation of the economic model into the more a moral one, ethical one in a traditional in a way, and uh, actually we find the recipe, we find the recipe in the Islamic tradition, we find the recipe in uh, the Christian tradition as well. Uh, we have several conferences on this topic uh, in Russia, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, with the participation of uh, the Russian Orthodox clergymen, uh, and uh, I have found the uh, uh, full support from uh, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church in uh, uh, in this subject, and so uh, we have some prominent businessmen in the Russian Federation uh, who are education of the national economy into the, uh, into the economy of golden standards, into the economy of uh, the tangible real assets. And similar efforts uh, we uh, could witness in uh, transformation of the national economy into the economy of uh, golden yuan. Some Muslim countries, including, uh, I presume, Malaysia, at the time of Mahathir uh, Muhammad, there was an attempt to transform it into the economy of golden dinar, and so on, so on. Many words could be said, but uh, due to the lack of I have to. Uh, I have to follow the rules, not to take much of your time. Just uh, to my mind, what is worth mentioning? Uh, now we are facing a global threat uh, of virtual economic values, virtual money, and eventually virtual uh, morals and virtual ethics. Uh, those countries speaking. Uh, those. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, so, uh, actually, that's all. Uh, oh, please finish uh, your that's sentence, That's my Mr. point, Chardonnay. just uh, not to neglect uh, the importance of the economic tension. I believe we, we may have lost them, Mr. Chernyenko. Are you... So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Taras. It's very important because uh, we need to think about the economy. We should not overestimate economy, I think, but we shouldn't separate economy from the spirit. The economy is not something separated. That's a part of our cultural attitude. So we need Im to embed economy in the culture. That is important, not to solve technically economically problem, not to make the economy more uh, um, uh, efficient, more um, effective, but to, to, to in, embed economy in the culture. That is the problem because economy taken from itself, that is already, uh, already suicidal practice. When we separate the body from the soul, the body is uh, uh, going to be the king. So we need, we need to have the balance between them. That is very important. Not against the economy, not to be obsessed uh, with the economy, but to put economy on the, uh, on the uh, natural, natural place in the rich context of a human being. It is important part, but it should be separate. And I think that uh, many uh, efforts in uh, Islamic economy are directed in that sense. But uh, uh, I think that um, th the theory here in the Islamic, in Islamic economy is much ahead of the practice because um, the, the, the, the logic of, of, the, of the scene, I would say, involve the people, including Muslims, uh, outside of that cultural and noble attitude to the economy, to the money, to put them in the cultural and religious context. So, but at the same time, the, theoretically, it's very important. And I think that we need to, to, to think about how to embed economical thought inside of 
uh, for uh, political uh, theory. Thank you for uh, to remind us uh, that. And now I would like to give uh, uh, um, the panel to my uh, very good friend, uh, Levan Vasadze, one of the leader of the World Family Congress, very prestigious and respectful organization, very famous uh, Georgian uh, politician, poet, um, and uh, mm, our friendship with him based on uh, on the same traditional traditional values. It is example how we could overcome very very deep uh, and painful historical, political, and geopolitical uh, conflicts. Please, uh, Levan. Thank you, Alexander Gelevich, uh, dear participants of the seminar. Honored to be here and glad to be participating. Um, all three political theories of modernity um, were introduced, as Professor Dugin rightfully points out in many of his works, in a particular order and were demolished and are being demolished in the reversed order. First came the oldest uh, individual-based liberalism. Second came the class-based communism. And third came the race-based Nazism or fascism. Their demolition took place throughout the 20th century and is carrying into 21st century in the reverse chronology. First, the oldest and the middle one held hands and destroyed, and thank God, destroyed Nazism. Then the oldest went ahead and demolished communism. And now we are witnessing the end of the oldest. I would like to stress three features which make all three of them twins. All three of them are totalitarian. Neither one of them is happy to have one part of a planet. All three of them are anti-religious and all three of them begin in linear progress and promise paradise on earth. All these three features unmistakably make them bastards of the same parent, and as in many cases, bastards who don't know their common parent, they fight among themselves. All of these three theses uh, relating them unmistakably uh, to one parent, one kitchen, one geography, make them completely opposite to any spiritual tradition around the globe. Every tradition believes in regress instead of a progress, and every tradition agrees on the end of the world, which these three deny. Our parents lived through an era of struggle among three of them. Many of us lived first halves of our lives uh, in the era of struggle among the remaining two of them. And we have spent the second halves of our lives living in the unipolar world, which is coming to an end. Barack Obama added to $10 trillion of US debt another $10 trillion. Just think about it. Every US president before him totally accumulated $10 trillion, and one president alone doubled it. Today, the total debt of United States uh, stands at $25 trillion, which if calculated on per capita US taxpayer means US owes the world $220,000 each, which means this debt will never be repaid and the system is coming to a collapse and to an end. Why the three political theories were introduced in this particular order and demolished in the opposite order. Uh, I have tried to express my views in my work called Three Horses of Apocalypses and the, four, in, and the first glance towards the fourth one, which you can find on Geopolitica.ru. I happen to believe that uh, from the same kitchen, from the same parent, 
we are about to witness the introduction of the fourth horseman of Apocalypse, which I believe will be tyranny. And the fundamental work that should be done by every traditionalist around the globe, irrespective of its ethnic, religious, or cultural background, is the development of the alternative political theory, which Alexander Gerlevich calls fourth political theory. I have had the honor and pleasure of many conversations and debates and discussions with Professor Dugin on the central subject of the fourth political theory, if liberalism was based on, on individual uh, Marxism or communism on class and fascism or Nazism on race, the key question to all of us is what should be the fundament, the subject of the fourth political theory alternative to the forthcoming tyranny? We all know that Alexander Gelevich's extensive scientific work uh, led him to choose Martin Heidegger's design as the fundament of fourth political theory. I have had the honor and, um, and the privilege of expressing my views and on some occasions I have said to Professor Dugin that design may be a, a fundamentally difficult concept to grasp for wide audiences and masses and I have humbly asked him to uh, propose and offer us a more understandable or a more sort of fast food version of design and I was extremely humbled and happy to see uh, in his subsequent works people as the subject, narod as the subject of the fourth political theory. The vision that I have, it does not contradict Professor Dugin's um, views, but perhaps it complements it in one way or the other. I belong to the school of thought that family should be chosen as pan-national, pan-religious, pan-cultural fundament for the fourth political theory. I'm not an individual. I am a component. I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm a grandson, I'm a friend. And if you, if you remove these features of mine, uh, I become the enemy, enemy of mankind. When I was growing up, my parents didn't take me around to Belize and didn't tell me, Levan, you have the right to do this, you have the right to do that. They told me, you don't have the right to do this, you don't have the right to do that. And they raised me in traditional Georgian uh, worldview, not of my rights, but of my obligations. Therefore, my humble view of the post-liberal world is in those parts of the world where societies choose to move to affirmative narrative of tradition is the society based not on human rights, but on human obligations and on family rights and on human obligations towards the family and towards the country. Therefore, I believe all 192 constitutions in the world need to be rewritten and somebody, some country, has to become the first one to write the constitution based on the family rights. This calls for complete alteration of economic paradigms, of philosophical and political paradigms. Um, I have been engaged in this work for three years now, and it is by far the most difficult intellectual challenge I have faced. And um, I invite all of you to participate in it, and I'm glad to be a part of our group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Levan. Uh, I think that um, uh, about family, we could consider that as something that is and somehow universal, not only in the cultural aspect, but as well the importance of, of the family for the society from, from the anthropological point of view. Uh, that was explained by uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss and including by psychoanalytical point of view because, because the relations between the gender figures and the family 
uh, des is destiny for, for the human being. And it is considered by uh, postmodernists uh, as a kind of um, uh, violence, but it could be considered differently. So I think to, we need, in context of the first political theory, uh, revise uh, somehow the value of the family, and that could be uniting point from uh, uh, many uh, uh, of all normal civilizations, I would say. So now um, I would like to, to, to, to give the words to, to a very famous lady uh, that uh, was uh, above all famous in the first stage of the Syrian war, she is known as Syrian girl that uh, had the courage to defend almost lost as it seemed at the time a cause of her people fighting desperately against the intervention against the total uh, extremism and mass destruction fueled by the globalist and the liberalism she is really heroic Correct person. I am really happy that Maram Susli, Syrian girl, is uh, with us. Please. Thank you, Professor. That was a wonderful introduction. I feel honored um, to be here amongst you all. I I wanted to talk to you first about uh, the fourth political theory as it applies to Syria. But uh, before that, I wanted to comment on some of the stuff that you said. Uh, at the beginning of the conference about what's happening in the United States and how basically, essentially, they're having a, a, a civil war similarly to the way Syria had one, and it is uh, manufactured, it's uh, being pushed by the establishment. So what we're seeing in the US is we're seeing two sides of the establishment fighting each other. And uh, I think that we, again, can see that what's happening, as happened in Syria, is a cultural genocide um, of uh, of Western, you know, society, which is something maybe we didn't expect to happen, especially when it's being done by their own hands. Um, so I just wanted to agree with you on that and concur. But I also wanted to talk to you about uh, again the fourth political theory as it applies to Syria and specifically the Syrian Socialist Nationalist Party, which is the SSNP for short. Um, this is a pan-Syrian party. Uh, it's the second largest political party in Syria. It's got members in parliament. Um, you know, there's an idea that it's just the Ba'ath party that rules everything, but, you know, we have other smaller parties. We also have a communist party. But uh, specifically, uh, the Syrian uh, Socialist Nationalist Party has a militia uh, called the Eagles of the Whirlwind, and they've been fighting, uh, the, you know, the heroic war against Al-Qaeda, ISIS and other terrorist groups. Um, this group uh, is pan-Syrian, which means it believes in the greater Syria, the unification of the Levant people. Um, it was formed in 1932 during the French occupation of the Levant. Um, basically, the Levantian people, if I may uh, explain, they are their own distinct group. They have a, their own dialect of Arabic, with many Aramaic uh, artifacts that are left over, like the guttural stop. For example, if I say, um, actually, the word slips me now, but you can look it up. The, the way that we speak Arabic is unique, uh, which means that for us, we cannot always understand Gulf Arabic and vice versa. This is because we have uh, our own uh, history uh, being part of the Roman Empire, Byzantinium, um, and so uh, we adopted the Arabic language after an invasion. So a lot of our uh, identity, our culture is very unique to, in the Middle East. Um, and at the time of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, there was two conflicting identities uh, that occurred in the Middle East, uh, especially for the Levant, one being the Arabic identity and one being this, the purely Syrian identity. Um, based on its history. And this was all happening at the backdrop of uh, the, the French invasion. So in 1920, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Uh, Syria actually at that point declared independence, uh, a state called the Arab Kingdom of Syria. And a few months later, unfortunately, it was invaded. Uh, but that shows you that already there was a distinct Syrian identity. It had its own 
natural borders that encompassed Palestine, Jordan, and Lebanon. And as occupiers do, you know, the French and the British, they played a game of divide and conquer. They uh, created uh, Palestine and then gave it to Israel. They, uh, the French created uh, Lebanon. They gave uh, a region of Syria called Hatay to Turkey. Um, and not only that, in, even though they gave up all of these uh, territories of Syria, um, they also create, tried to create divisions within Syrian society on ethnic religious lines. Um, and this is the backdrop by which the SSMP was formed. Uh, his, uh, the founder, uh, Anton Sade, his uh, manifesto, The Genesis of Nations, basically uh, touched on the ideas of the fourth political theory um, because he did take some of his political ideological inspirations from the German National Socialist Party, but he rejected a lot of the racial purity aspects of it. And instead, he looked at the Syrian nation as a natural evolution of a shared history of distinct groups that existed in the Levant for thousands of years. Um, and, you know, this, uh, as well as this, you know, he had some very valuable ideas that uh, Syria is for all Syrians, um, you know, and uh, the interference of foreign uh, I, I, uh, agendas shouldn't um, overtake the agenda of the Syrian people. So what is best for Syrians should come first. Um, so that means uh, it's not just specifically what's best for Arab minority or Kurds or just Palestinians or just Christians or any other ethnic group. Um, and of course, it also means that we don't have foreign influences like uh, Wahhabist Islamism, uh, y you know, uh, uh, evangelical Christians, Zionism, all trying to interfere and uh, undermine the Syrian agenda. Um, so this, st this entire thing is absolutely, uh, rele was relevant 100 years ago uh, during the fall of the Ottoman Empire, and it's relevant today. Because what's happening in, today, in Syria today is you have occupying powers, they came in, they uh, fueled religious and ethnic sectarianism, they're trying to divide Syria, they had their Wahhabist militias, Al-Qaeda currently controls Idlib, uh, and you have the uh, anarcho-communist liberal uh, Kurdish militia groups controlling the entire northeast of the country, where all the oil and all of the wheat happened to be um, basically the breadbasket of Syria is in that region that the U.S. occupies and wants to cut up into a Kurdistan. So not only that, it's, it's not really based on population because it's the majority of living in that area is not Kurdish. They're a plurality, not a majority. So uh, there are other ethnic groups there. So it's not about, uh, you know, it's, it's an excuse basically to just divide the country and get rid of Syria's resources. So the ideas of the uh, Syrian uh, Socialist Nationalist Party apply now more than ever, and not only because of uh, the occupation of Syria by the U.S., but also by um, the Zionist uh, entity that is threatening Syria's very existence, um, perpetually expanding, and uh, uh, basically, um, you know, these liberal ideas as well, like they exist in that place. They, they, they, they, they war in Syria. At the very beginning, uh, the way that it was promoted to the West was uh, by we are saving homosexuals from a despotic regime. They invented a girl called Gay Girl in Damascus that turned out to be an American man uh, living in Canada that was making a blog. So this liberalism is um, definitely trying to inject itself into our society. And if we you know, don't accept it readily, they just basically do it at the barrel of a gun. Um, so I just wanted to uh, I'd not take up too much of your time. Um, if there, anyone has anything to say, just that the, you know, today the words of and the ideology of the SSNP is very, very important for, for Syria to remain united because it's a very unifying ideology in, in that it's better than Arabism because uh, it, there are part, aspects of Syrian uh, society that don't identify as Arab. And by promoting um, just an Arab identity, it kind of denies them uh, the ability to connect with the rest of the Syrian fabric. So I'm talking about uh, Caucasians, Armenians, and people that just identify as Aramean. 
uh, which is the the original uh, Syrian ethnicity. Um, so that's that's what is uh, one of the Syrian ideologies that maybe not many people have heard about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very important thing. Uh, uh, I, I know a little bit about this political movement. I have met some representatives of it in Lebanon as well in Europe. Uh, um, they seem very seem interesting, but they represent rather, as long as I could understand, the third political theory. A Syrian version, Arab version, and fourth political theory uh, is trying to overcome uh, third political theory. That, that that is a very important shift. It is it is not the same. It is not just new name for third political theory. So fourth political theory uh, tra is trying to to to uh, to demodernize uh, po political thought. So for example, this invitation of the early Ba'ath party. To get to the Arab identity, to uh, to to to get deeper uh, in the uh, in the roots of what is Arab design, it's was very important. And the Syrians uh, were uh, at the region of this Basist uh, uh, Arabic ideology, and they were not Muslim, but they were Christian, for example, Syrian Christian. So it is very interesting. Uh, now we could not return to the no, Basism as it is. It's too com to to destroyed by history, to discredited. But uh, there were some very interesting inspiration in the origin, at the first stage of uh, creation of Ba'ath Party, where uh, Arab identity, deep secret Arab identity, was mixed with some kind of Islamic thought. So we, uh, we need, I think, uh, now in the, uh, all Arab world, there is very imp important challenge. We need to find a new idea of identification because Salafism that pretended to be such idea has collapsed totally, has lost totally. So we need something to propose to Arab Islamic world and that should reflect deep Arab identity on one hand and Islamic tradition on the other hand. And I think that Sufi tradition, this inner, uh, uh, inner Islam, Batiniya, in some in some way, uh, can play this part, including in creation of new political paradigm in Islamic world. It's just suggestion, but I think we could um, we could um, uh, search in this direction. We are all very very uh, very concerned with the uh, revival of uh, Islamic world, and now we Russians we are fighting there. We we have helped. To, to, to, to save Syria uh, on the edge of the total destruction. But we have no key for the future. It's up to you to, to find your own future. And we will be uh, uh, happy to help uh, you. I think we, we need to combine Arab identity, Islamic tradition, basing on some maybe spiritual, spiritual values, so rich in great Syrian country. And um, uh, our, our friend, uh, Princess Victoria, spent many, many years in uh, your country teaching the, the richness, the treasury of Islamic tradition. Uh, she will speak a little later. And now I, I, would, I would like to give the word to Atkash Jalil from Turkey. It is a, a very interesting the other story. Because in Turkey, I have met uh, 20 years ago the people who shared totally, uh, totally my geopolitical uh, understanding of what is going on. They were Kemalists, uh, and they were not um, Islamists or Sufi circles. They were not traditionalists in the normal way. I would imagine they should be rather traditional right, but they were a Kemalist left. But uh, that was for me a kind of a very interesting discovery. And from uh, uh, this time, I have revised my opinion on Kemalism as purely modern uh, vision. So, um, uh, so I, I'm very interested in this Eurasian form of Kemalism. Uh, and we could find the, the, uh, the friends where we don't uh, suppose, we don't have uh, uh, no idea that they could be there. So uh, that is why it's important to be open, 
to hear the other, to not to, to, to deal with prejudices. And uh, I would like to give the word to Atkash uh, Jelil from Turkey with the topic Kemalism and Turkish geopolitics. I, I, I, I uh, ask uh, Mr. Jalil not to come into details of the geopolitics because now we have so many uh, difficult points with Turkey, with Syria, uh, in, in Libya. Let's try to stress what uh, unites us and let's to, to restore the dignity of your original Eurasian Kemalism uh, as uh, uh, world vision. Please. Countries. Like, for example, in Venezuela, there's Bolivarianism. In Hungary nowadays, they are talking about illiberalism. And in Turkey, there have been Kemalism almost for a hundred years. And this is a kind of indigenous ideology of our country. And as Turkish people, where did Kemalism and the Turkish modernization came from is actually a necessity. Turkish uh, modernization uh, was not an act of degeneration of the tradition, but a necessity to restore the tradition, to keep the tradition or the national values alive. Because you may recall the Chinese boxers, you know, the boxer rebellion in the beginning of the 20th century. These boxers were really, really brave men. They had a total Taoist face, faith, they had spears, fists, and Kung Fu techniques to fight the Western colonizers and also the Japanese, but they had machine guns and machine guns were superior against the traditional fighting techniques. So they lost the war. And this happened to Turkey too. After World War I, Turkey was divided, invaded. And with the victory of Ataturk's army against the invaders, Turkey felt the necessity to modernize itself. Because if an invasion fleet comes to your country, if you don't have superior warships, then how can you survive? Thus, modernization came to Turkey as a necessity. And on the other hand, uh, Turkey is a unique country for being at the crossroads. Well, I think after me, you are going to now host speakers from Europe, which is very natural. Because Turkey, as you say, in the between of west and east and just as this we have a lot in common with balkan people we have a lot in common with arab people we have a lot in common with iranian and slavic people especially with russians too because we lived with them for thousands of years and this brought a unique tradition and this always reminds me this fact as you all said we are very different yet we are all human and we are linked somehow and by Promoting the places where we are linked, we can also promote peace and mutual respect in our planet because we have simply no other plan planet to go, at least yet. <laughs> and also about Kemalism, uh, Turkish people have been suffering because of many geopolitic crises. Uh, you know these things all better than I know, maybe sometimes. Well, I'm also, you know, as a citizen of Turkey, daily day to day we are coming across with a new geopolitical crisis and to be honest it is really hard to catch on with the turkish uh, geopolitical crisis of these days nevertheless there is something good that crisis makes people think and nowadays i can openly say that the atlanticist point of worldview in turkey is now decreasing and your asianist aspects of the politicians are highly increasing but politicians are not always reliable because they act on the votes and their um, kind of profits. But the people that share a secret together is very important because everything can be broken. As long as the secret of the people are not broken, then that country will not be broken either. Because that secret enables the nation to build itself even if they will fall a thousand times. Therefore, um, in Turkey, as, we, as you said, Kemalism may not seem like a Sufism or an Islamic tradition, or it is not a fully modernization or westernization either. It is not a westernization process. Nevertheless, as a country like Turkey, a huge basket where various traditions come, from, uh, come together, a tolerant, secular approach to these uh, traditions would be great. 
and this is what Atatürk tried to do. But unfortunately, with the death of Atatürk, Atatürk's perspective uh, turned into some sort of westernization by his followers, and this is why Turkey became a part of NATO, and uh, at the, and unfortunately left the traditional uh, Kemalist worldview. But now, as you say, left Kemalists, especially as far as I know, Doğu Perinçek, uh, also Attila İlhan as a very important intellectual in Turkey, try to revive that tradition by their intellectual works. And I must admit that their works are very strong in terms of academical uh, arena. Another thing I would like to add is, uh, before I'm going to you know, stop my speech, I would like to highlight something. 100 years ago from this, Atatürk made alliances in Europe with not France, not England, not the NATO countries, but with the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, with Greece, the former enemy of Turkey back then, and Romania. Why? Because we, and also Turkey, as a country that had roots in Balkans, had a lot in common with these nations. And we had common enemies, which was fascism of Italy, which was trying to expand to this geography. On the other hand, Atatürk had a very friendly and inclusive policy to most of the Arabs. He made alliances with Iraq, later on with Iran and Afghanistan, because they believed that together, if they would unite their forces, they could find a third way against the um, Western colonist expansionism, especially the expansionism of British Empire back then. Also, he created alliance with Soviet Union, which they shared their ideological anti-imperial similarity. As far as I remember, this music has started. Uh, I'm exceeding my time, so there's a lot to talk, but uh, I would like to leave now. And please share the name of the composer of this music, because I really like that and hope to listen afterwards. And thank you very much for your speech, also for you, Mr. Dugin, and for all, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, you, thank, thank you very much, much uh, dear Atkash uh, Jalil. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to, to, to, to have such, uh, such a friends in Turkey as people who share uh, this uh, uh, version of Kemalism, spiritual Kemalism, open Eurasianist. So uh, always, we, we, we, many years, we have uh, we, we have helped to avoid the real war between our uh, countries, basing on our uh, reversible friendship that didn't and doesn't depend from any political situation. So it is a real pleasure. And now I would like to, uh, to, to give uh, the words to um, our Lebanese, uh, Lebanese um, uh, very famous anchor of my Dean television and uh, uh, the other heroic woman of resistance to uh, Lady Zainab Safar. Uh, and uh, uh, it's interesting. So we have so, uh, we have more er heroic ladies than, uh, than men. So that is uh, something beautiful, I think. So please, uh, dear Zainab, it's up to you, the panel. Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, Dr. Duga, for the invitation. and. Uh, salam and greetings to all of the participants and all the followers. Well, concerning the emergence of multipolarity with Russia and China as uh, semi-independent poles and the persistence of Islamic countries such as Iran, Turkey and Pakistan and so on, um, to follow their own agenda disregarding the pressures of the liberal West, I would like to focus on Lebanon not as an Islamic country, but as a country who has a land port to all of these countries in order to pursue in its uh, economic, political, social uh, dynamics. Well, uh, today more than before, we are witnessing the symptoms of the dissolution of liberalism as everyone was talking about and neoliberalism paradigm that are powerfully apparent on the cultural, um, civilizational, economic, ethical, socio-political levels. And the world today has to look for an alternative paradigm and without this new alternative, the world would get more and more submerged and uh, uh, left into chaos and instabilities. This monstrous liberalism, which is clearly manifested in its vehement, outrageous demeanor and behavior in the various sectors um, uh, 
like for example the least to talk about is the u.s this vicious criminal sanctions tool used against multiple countries and governments and international institutions and the personnel and also against individuals like those used against people in Russia, in Cuba, in China, in Syria, in Lebanon, Venezuela, and most recent against Turkey, and the call for such kind of sanctions against uh, uh, Turkey, such kind of policies have put the whole world um, in a state of turbulence and insecurity and categorical instability. Consequently, all the eyes today are turning or looking or aspiring to a different uh, model. Due to the West's unfortunate and utter subjugation and subordination to the US of A uh, administration's various consecutive administration's policies, that's why we need to rebalance the world through the gate of multipolarity and the rise of international poles like Russia and China and regional poles like Iran, Turkey, uh, Pakistan, India and so on to face to counter the American hegemony here in our region and elsewhere. Its hegemony here in our region is loud and clear and totally built on the protection and full endorsement of um, and this we have to say that we have to underscore and we have to uh, always try to see everything in the prism of this particular issue which is the U.S. full uh, fledged endorsement of the Israeli occupation and uh, this entity which is practicing the most egregious and heinous injustice, persecution, and crimes against the owners of the land, the Palestinians, and the whole world. And so, um, and all of this in front of the, the so-called uh, international community that are just very silent, mute, uh, their voices are totally muffled vis-a-vis -vis what is going on against the Palestinian people who have never regained any of their rights, particularly the right of return under the UN Resolution 194 adopted in 1948. And now with Netanyahu's annexation plans, if put into uh, practice and implementation, it would render all Palestine lost to the Israeli occupation. No more Palestine, uh, we, we can see. And we have seen this uh, clearly manifested also in the way Google Maps, they have just, you know, uh, wiped out Palestine from the maps. Uh, not to forget that Israel still occupies also land in Lebanon and Syria and continuously violates the Lebanese airspace and the most recent of which uh, took place uh, less than a week ago. Likewise, uh, not to forget to talk about Caesar's act against uh, Syria, uh, which took effect and this will not only target Syria, but it will also target Lebanon, because Lebanon, uh, Syria is the only land route to Lebanon, uh, from Lebanon to the whole east. And this is going to negatively affect the economy of Lebanon. So Lebanon is a bitterly divided country, which has been presented with a US ultimatum. Either today, either you starve as your economy suffers a meltdown and disintegrates, or you have to ask your president, President Town, you have to disarm and render Hezbollah politically impotent, and you have to drive their members out of Lebanon and acquiesce to the American regional dictates. And uh, what is that? It is that Lebanon and its government must be led by Hariri, who is a former prime minister, and must then endorse and accept the deal of the century and demarcate Lebanon's borders, both the land and the maritime borders, with uh, Israel and try to nationalize also with underscore of this all the Palestinian population or the Palestinian refugees who are in Lebanon in the context of also trying to nationalize uh, uh, the Syrians who are displaced in Lebanon and this would tip the balance of demography and you know that Lebanon is a country that uh, has this kind of sectarian confessional demographics uh, complex uh, that is, if we are going to nationalize the Palestinian population, there is no more right of return. And for doing this, Lebanon then might receive a $6 billion uh, earmarked, but not furnished under the deal for the uh, resettling of the Palestinians. This dilemma for Lebanon is like either you starve or there's going to be a kind of civil war. But 
this dilemma, uh, people inside Lebanon, spearheaded by Hezbollah, they found a solution for it. Why don't we head east? Why don't we look east to China, which has offered its assistance to uh, many other countries uh, in the east? And we're not going to turn our back to the west because this would make a very big problem to many uh, uh, of the people who are uh, affiliated with the West, like particularly the March 14th uh, powers. Uh, Hezbollah Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah clearly and loudly said that, well, if the US is only attempting at suffocating, smothering, and asphyxiating us and our people in Lebanon under its knee, we will never give them this opportunity at all. We will look towards the East, towards Iran, towards China, towards Russia, towards Turkey. But for now, some Lebanese political leaders are more concerned to nurse old hatreds and can make no decision. Still, still, you know, uh, things are going on the right track, though not very much announced, but it's going on the right uh, track. We are adamant on heading east. We will not let our people starve. Lebanon has resources. It's not bankrupt, though it is presented as such in order to exert more and more pressures um, vocalizing that Hezbollah is always the real problem at the heart of all this strenuous economic situation. Um, always trying to highlight that, well, if you want a solution to your economic problems in Lebanon, let Hezbollah, uh, who has become a part and parcel of any international pivot, let Hezbollah disappear, oust them from Lebanon, and all Lebanon's problems will be resolved. This will never, ever happen. We are the people of Lebanon. We have scored the highest average rates in the recent parliamentary elections in 2018. Not to forget that Hezbollah affiliated, uh, the Hezbollah affiliated Minister of Health uh, has demonstrated a very successful model of dealing with the coronavirus pandemic. And this has put Lebanon among the first 15 countries in succeeding in facing this dilemma. Hezbollah devised a compact plan to counter the coronavirus. And uh, it, it is titled that it is the social resistance to a corona-free homeland. And Hezbollah has put 24,500 healthcare workers under disposal to reduce the spread until the threat is completely eliminated. The resistance dealt a severe blow to the so-called invincible Israeli army in 2006. It is protecting Lebanon and it has confronted successfully the extremist Wahhabist takfiris of ISIS and al-Nusra uh, uh, against uh, and their aggression against Lebanon in 2017. We sacrificed and we will keep on doing so to protect our country and people and to live in dignity in our homeland. One last thing, if I may, um, there is a massive aggressive media disinformation campaign regarding the negotiations with the Chinese side and uh, what are the Chinese offers uh, uh, to the point, uh, and this massive media disinformation campaign, it's claiming that China is not interested in pursuing any business deals or investment talks with Lebanon. That is totally, and I can assure you, and uh, I'm saying information, not analysis, this is very baseless because the Chinese officials and companies, they have started actual meetings and negotiations. Uh, with a number of ministers uh, in Lebanon, in the Lebanese cabinet, uh, with positive outcomes uh, to be announced uh, later. So the bottom line, and I don't want to take too long, but also what is happening to Lebanon is also duplicated and it's also taking place against Iraq uh, because of what Iraq is also uh, having the talks and the, the agreements with the Chinese uh, side. Bottom line, this U.S. model, this U.S. approach, this Western approach, a model is proven to have failed in our region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Zainab. Interesting that in Lebanon and Beirut, we have spoken with uh, Lady Safar uh, very long about forced political theory and no machia. My, uh, philosoph philosophical project, 24 volumes. So I, I was really very uh, astonished by so intellectual, profound, and uh, brave 
person. Uh, so that was the real, uh, real pre uh, precious um, treasury uh, found in uh, Lebanon. So uh, I have um, met at the same uh, conference uh, last year, very interesting figure in Lebanon, um, Mr. Uh, Jamal Vakim, who, uh, in my opinion, is the best uh, specialist in geopolitics in Arab world. I, I in my uh, preface to my um, uh, manual on geopolitics, I deplored that uh, Arab uh, world uh, doesn't uh, possess necessary uh, um, uh, and uh, independent school of geopolitics. And meeting with, after meeting with uh, Jamal Wakim, I have changed my mind. So uh, I'm very, very, very happy that um, uh, the, the, the uh, scholar with such high level of knowledge in geopolitics participates uh, in our uh, conference. Please, uh, Mr. Jamal Wakim. Thank you very much, Professor Dugan, for this introduction. And it's nice to meet you again, though. Uh, Via, uh, via video conferencing. Uh, first, uh, I was lucky to have uh, Ms. Uh, Maram and uh, Ms. Zainab speak before me because actually they have uh, laid down the ground for my speech. Uh, I would agree up to 90% of what they have already said before and I would like, my intervention is to uh, talk mainly about the relevance of an alternative uh, theory, uh, which is the fourth political theory, uh, its relevance to Lebanon at a time when this country is living or passing through an existentialist uh, uh, crisis, actually. Uh, first, I would like to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, talk about the rise of this country and how it happened from an alternative perspective. I disagree with the mainstream school of history that depicts the history of Lebanon as a continuation of the uh, ancient Phoenician whatever uh, uh, history because it was a Eurocentric and Western uh, projected idea. Uh, first, Lebanon has always been part of the Greater Levant, uh, the, uh, uh, which included, uh, in addition to present time Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Palestine, parts of uh, southern Turkey, and even parts of central Iraq. So, uh, the, uh, and during the Ottoman rule, actually, the, this region uh, was divided into uh, three wilayats or uh, provinces, which were Damascus, Aleppo, and Saida. Later on, they, uh, there were a new organizations, especially in the late 19th century, with Beirut becoming the wilaya, uh, stretching from Antioch in the north all the way to Askelon in uh, the south, uh, with Damascus as a province in the hinterland and uh, Aleppo in the north. So th th that was the state of affairs. Uh, Lebanon, starting from the 17th century onward, actually it was the uh, ha haven for French capital investment, for uh, mercantile uh, capital investment, actually. And it promoted elites coming from Syria's hinterland, mainly from Aleppo and from Damascus. So the, the present time capitalist class of Lebanon is mainly uh, an Aleppine uh, uh, originated uh, class. Uh, I can name a few families like the uh, Sahnawi, Fattal, Khabbaz, and other families. So uh, this French capital, uh, for, for two and a half centuries, Lebanon relied heavily on this French mercantile capital until the end of the Second World War. And uh, uh, the French capital uh, actually uh, heavily invested with uh, a Catholic, let's say, Levantine uh, churches, which were uh, Levantine Christian uh, uh, sects that acknowledged the Pope's supremacy, uh, including the Maronites and the Greek Catholics. And uh, later on, uh, the, the predominance of French capital 
remained until the uh, first half of the 20th century when it was actually uh, infiltrated with, uh, to a limited extent, with the British capital and later with Anglo-Saxon capital, uh, especially from the 1960s onward, the American capital, which was translated into the petrodollar. And this is where uh, the, aim, uh, the traditional uh, Lebanon started to pass through a crisis because the Anglo-Saxon capital had a gateway to the region, which was the Gulf region, and it could dispense of Lebanon as a gateway. So we were heavily influenced by Western, uh, uh, mainly European uh, thought, whether on the liberal, uh, on the conservative, on the liberal, and even on the leftist, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ideology. So our liberals were pretty much influenced by French liberalism, uh, whereas our conservatism was also pretty much influenced by Italian fascism and, uh, to a lesser extent, Nazi fascism, uh, the Falange Party mainly. And uh, later on, even leftist, the Communist Party, even the Communist Party, its role model was the uh, French, uh, let's say, uh, uh, French communism rather than Soviet communism, starting from the late 1960s uh, onward. And uh, this is why I believe that all these elites at one point could not uh, pose an alternative to the crisis, to the, to the existentialist crisis that Lebanon is passing through. Because we reached a moment, especially in, the 19, in 1975, where the Americans, uh, with their capital, the petrodollar, moved or shifted their attention towards the Gulf region and uh, used Lebanon as a weak, uh, let's say, uh, uh, weak uh, uh, side or weak point to this, uh, disrupt and uh, destabilize Syria. And this explains the Lebanese civil war because it was in one dimension an attempt at destabilizing Syria. And this explains why uh, Hafez Assad had to intervene because he thought that if he didn't intervene, instability would pass over to Syria. And this was part also of a greater scheme by the Zionists and by the Americans to redraw the geopolitical map of the region to divide and rule by dividing what was already divided into sub-entities based on confessions and on ethnic ethnicities and tribes in order for uh, Israel to be not a minority among or in a uh, uh, within a greater majority, but to become the greater minority in a group of minorities. And this explains why Iraq later on after 2003 was Lebanized. The Lebanese formula was projected onto Iraq. And this was also an attempt, uh, the Americans and the Zionists tried to project this onto Syria by trying to promote the idea of uh, ethnic federalism in Syria, which was rejected by the Syrian leadership so far and the Syrian state. So now the Americans want to use the uh, use Lebanon as a source of instability to Syria, as Syria slipped out of their hands to a large extent. And by this, they they, they were the ones to cause the or to push uh, Lebanon on the brinks of collapse because they already controlled the financial sector. They were the ones to appoint the governor of the central bank, Riyad Salemi, and they are the ones to control all other uh, banks by their policies and by, uh, by the way, half of the Lebanese people have dual nationality, for example, and including those officials appointed or elected as presidents, prime ministers, and members of parliament. So their loyalty is jeopardized by having people at, uh, paying the oath of allegiance to other countries. So, and this is, I, I, I don't believe, for example, in Russia or in Egypt or even in Syria, 
if someone has another nationality, uh, nationality uh, he would be eligible to uh, be elected to a public post. Whereas in Lebanon, this is not the case. So uh, these people were pushed, the, the financial sector, the, uh, which is linked, which has been linked actually since 1966 to the Federal Bank of uh, New York or uh, in the United States, uh, in Fort Knox actually, uh, and abides by the policies of Fort Knox rather than the Lebanese government, uh, brought the, uh, the country on the brink of collapse, especially that subsequent uh, governments since 1992 have uh, destroyed the productive sectors. So now we see all elites, including the conservatives, the leftists, and the liberals, of course, uh, working within the American agenda, and even those who are posing as or calling for uh, opening up to Eurasia, they are blocked by the fact that they are marginals to the core state that controls the state in Lebanon. So they are still marginals. They, uh, they are not the deep state, too bad. And I believe that they don't have a real agenda to go eastward. And that's why I believe that we are facing the Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry for interrupt, but, uh, but uh, now I, I, I would like to say that uh, um, uh, now um, uh, we have done with Asia and uh, or Caucasus, that is uh, the, the center of the world. Uh, Caucasus, and uh, I think now um, we should uh, we should come to Africa, Africa in a, in a, in a uh, real sense. I apologize for a little bit um, while uh, uh, while uh, violating the timing. Uh, sorry for that, because uh, um, my uh, our good friend Kemisiba. Uh, the, the fighter for the African identity, very famous in Africa. Now he is, I think, the number one man in Africa. He is uh, radically fighting against all form of colonialism and neo-colonialism. And who is, at the same time, very interested in the fourth political theory and uh, as well in uh, uh, traditionalism of Ganon. He is uh, unique, as long as I know, uh, follower of René Guénon uh, in Africa. He try, he believes strongly in, in the primordial tradition, so it is very rare. He has sent, he couldn't participate because he's very engaged in politics. He now is in travel from uh, between different African countries. He has sent uh, to us uh, the video, specially uh, recorded for for our conference. It is longer, much longer um, than it was uh, presumed, uh, but uh, uh, let uh, Africa speak. She, uh, they were so many uh, hundred years silent, so uh, uh, let uh, uh, uh, Africa speak finally, and uh, he, the voice of Kimisiba, the great, uh, great uh, uh, Kimisiba, will uh, um, a kind of uh, um, representative, the ambassador of this uh, African uh, uh, voice. So it uh, uh, will last uh, somehow 16 minutes, so uh, please uh, um, uh, uh, be patient and let, uh, let Africa speak. Please be upon to you, all of you. I address this message as spokesman of the Pan-African movement and as a chairman of the organization Pan-African Emergency. I address this message to all the anti-globalist movement in Asia, in South America, in Arabic world, and even in Western world, even if they will have, they will have many precision about this message for the anti-globalist movement in Western Hemisphere. It's important to give a salute to my comrade Alexander Dugin, who organized this conference and who invited me 
to give the voice of African people and African grassroots who are tired about globalism with another name of colonialism, savage colonialism, in this day and in the past day too. First, it's important to precise many things for speak about the situation of globalism for African people. It's important to give you a feedback about the fact that many people speak about the new world order, order in the 21st century. But what is new for you is former and old for us. The globalism is a new illness for you. But the globalism, we discovered globalism when Cristobal Colon came in America. When the whites and Caucasian colonizers came in Africa, it was globalization. Because they tried to force us to hunt her in the world. And I know that for this reason that I, I spoke about the preci precision for the Western anti-globalist movement. We need precision, hmm? clarification. Because many times, many people and many nations are against globalism, definitely. Many, many, many. There is a rise of the anti-globalist movement. But there are uh, a selective memory for analyze the situation in the world. Globalists can't be good in one area of the world, in one side, and be bad in another side. If globalism is good, it's good everywhere. If globalism is bad, if globalism is Satan world, is bad everywhere. And the fact is that colonization and slavery were the first way of globalism. The liberal oligarchy forced us, had forced us to enter in the new world, in the world, in the world of globalism. They forced us to take the religion. They forced us to take the name. They forced us to take the language. That's globalization. When you speak about the individualism, when you speak about all the deviation of the modern society, slavery and colonization forced, had forced us to enter in this way of thinking and only the more resistance until today stays the same and stay away from the tradition. So it's important to say strongly and deeply that we, you can't be anti-globalist in one way and be, and be tolerant with globalism when the globalism is attacking Africa first. If there is solidarity in one way, there is solidarity everywhere. Or, or if it's not the case, we will, all of us, organize ourselves by our, for our own people, and we will never be again solid, in, in solidarity with the other side of the world. We need to be clear about this fact. After this precision were very important, it's important to say that the resistance of globalism were organized since a long time by many elders in the Pan-African struggle. Julius Nyere understood the necessity to have a deep understanding of geopolitics first, but the deep understanding of the necessity to organize a way of solidarity and give a tradition in our minds. As a Pan-Africanist leader, I say in the 21st century that if we, have, we don't have the understanding of the 
original, aboriginal, the first tradition, primordial tradition, as said René Guénon, will not be able to fight. Because it's not only a battle between the liberal and the illiberal and the anti-liberal movement, no. It's a war between the plan of God and the plan of the devil. And the devil today in the modern world, the devil today is honestly the Western oligarchy and their purpose everywhere in the world. And if we want to resist, we need to understand that communists have failed. Have failed. We need to understand, but I think it's not necessary to, to speak about that, but fascism were defeated. And fascism is not good for African people, definitely. Globalism is a major illness of the world. So, because globalists try to destroy the roots of all people, the medicine against globalism can only be a medicine will give us the possibility to make more stronger our roots. Not roots in the way only of origin, but roots in the way of being more linked with God. Whatever the name you give to God. In my area, we give the name of God Mao, M-A-W-U. In another area, we speak in Africa about God and we give him the name of Olodumare. In another way, we speak about uh, the name of God, we give the name of God as Zambe. Whatever the, the, the name you want to call God, we need to know that there is one God, only one God. Nobody gives birth to God. And we say that God didn't give birth to something. He is a supreme creator. And if we are able to understand the necessity to have more stronger roots who link us with the essence of God and with the essence of humanity, we will be able to resist more clearly more beautifully, more strongly against the devil's, the devilish society with the modern world, with the liberalism. We have a different kind of exception about uh, the, the manner of uh, resist against uh, this different manifestation of the globalism in Africa. Because the globalism everywhere in the world use for destabilized country, use uh, civil, civil society for destabilizing nation. But in Africa, that's different because our elites are so deeply manipulated already by the globalist oligarchy. Then the way of resistance is only inside the civil, civil society not inside the head of states. So in uh, Arabic nation or in Caucasian nation or maybe in South America, the globalists are infiltrated in uh, civil society. In Africa too, in, in, in fact. But the most powerful resistance against globalism in Africa is inside the civil society and Pan-African movement is the most, more beautiful, the most beautiful example of my, my talking today. So, for conclude, because I don't want to be too much long, but I will try to be strong, it's important to make an appeal for everybody who try to think. Excuse me if my English is not perfect, but I wish that you will understand us. Globalism is the most dangerous illness in the world. And if the people everywhere in the world don't understand the necessity, 
the necessity to be in the way of solidarity everywhere in the exact and the same way of intolerance against globalism if we are not able to understand the necessity to be in the way of solidarity globalists will defeat, defeat all of us in the next day if for example Russia who had uh, recreated multipolar wars who is very important but if Russia leading this multipolar world wants to become a new supremacist nation who act exactly like globalists in Africa, we will defeat, we will resist against the so-called anti-globalist Russia. I said already that to my comrades that I respect deeply, and I think that he respect me deeply in back, Alexander Dugin, um, in the same way with him about the necessity of understanding the danger of globalism. But each people need to respect each other. When I see some nation, they, they speak about anti-globalism. Globalism is not good, it's not good. But when they come in Africa, they become more dangerous than globalist nation. So we need to be clear about what everybody wants and what everybody wish. The nation and the people need a true understanding and need to be honest with the other. Because if there is a lack of honesty, they will have war in the future. Not only war between globalist and anti-globalist movements, but war inside the anti-globalist movement because African people will never accept again that globalists or anti-globalists try to colonize us. That's not victimization, that's clarification. And in the same way, because it's important to precise, for example, in South America or in America, I said and we said again, and we said and said and said, and we will say it again, that we are against the manipulation of the globalist George Soros uh, and uh, um, the, the Black uh, Lives Matters. We are against that. We love deeply our people who are who is manifesting, but we don't want this manipulation. Because we say that our people that we love so much, the diaspora of black people, is manipulated. Some of the diaspora, not all of the diaspora, but is manipulating, manipulated by George Shows. Okay. But saying that doesn't mean that if there is anti-globalist movement who attack our brother and sister in Black Lives Matters, we will be with the anti-globalist white movement. Never. We need to be clear about that. We need to explain to our people the problem in the diaspora, and it's that our responsibility. But we will never accept that some anti-globalist or white organization who pretend to be anti-globalist attack our people instead of attack only the manipulator. Because the enemy is not the people who is manipulated. The enemy is who is manipulating all the people. We need to understand that for Berkeley. And if we are all in the way of the prim primordial tradition, the original tradition, we need to understand that even if we have different color, we have the same essence. But we will never beg that. We will never, never, and never beg some uh, uh, question of uh, rec uh, reconnaissance, of um, recognizing of our humanity. No. We will respect only people who will respect us. And if there is some nation who don't respect us deeply, we will fight them 
definitely. Africa free of death. Globalism must death. And we do all is possible. All is possible for our people to destroy definitely this heinous who is responsible of slavery, colonization, and the new colonization that we know in this modern day. Take care about you. I love you. Peace be upon to you. Great, uh, Africa voice. Uh, so uh, that is uh, really, really brilliant uh, uh, words against manipulation, against necessity to be honest uh, in promoting uh, our ideals. And I agree absolutely with every word, every letter of Kimisiba. And I think that, uh, that peoples shouldn't be uh, a kind of victim of the geopolitics. If we are sincere and honest, we should help to Africa to be free and not exchange one form of colonization by other. So that is a, Kemisiba is the huge example of representative, in my opinion, of fourth political theory, traditionalism, and a kind of Eurasianism, because it is in favor of uniting to creating a great uh, uh, African gross round. So I appreciate uh, Kimi Siba uh, knows Rene Guinon. He uh, shares, he follows this uh, primordial tradition and he seeks the, the elements of this tradition in African culture. Culture. So that is really, really a man, a man of, uh, I think, of the future. And the people like him should represent Africa. He is clearly against manipulation of BLM, of this postmodernist post um, uh, simulacrum of uh, fight for the dignity and the freedom. And uh, that is the real voice. Yeah.